All right. Well, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Cindy Buteau, and I'm founder and CEO of Space Commerce Matters. Really pleased to be here today. Uh, we've got a great agenda. We have Lynn Harper, uh, NASA Strategic Integration Advisor, uh, Chris Cannell, Carl Cannell, and Michael uh, Gallen from uh, Airbus um, US. And then we have really an open discussion with all of you as subject matter experts. Um, and what the intent of today really is, is a follow-up to the webinar we had on November 30th, where we presented the Airbus external platform and talking about it as an ideal vehicle, especially given the oversubscription uh, in a lot of different uh, facility areas for NASA, for the ISS National Lab, both internal and external. Um, Bartolomeo has and Airbus have done a lot of work to um, create roadmaps from the FRAM based um, NASA structures to the gold connectors, and there's a cradle to grave service. But the biggest thing that came out of that first workshop is when we talked about the work that's being done from an Airbus Bartolomeo perspective on looking at semiconductors and advanced material um, uh, formulation and production. And that's really what we're doing today, uh, not as a webinar, but as an interactive workshop. Uh, so without further ado, I am gonna move along here. And I think the biggest point of where we're at right now is, you know, we, we talk about inflection points and we talk about them as, you know, sort of a, you know, it's, it's a common phrase, but we really are at an inflection point with endless possibilities. And it is a true statement that the marvels of the new modern world will take place in space. And space will be viewed as our third great revolution. You know, we've moved from an industrial revolution to a digital revolution. And now we're looking at space as that third great revolution. There's a big importance of in-space material, R&D, fabri fabrication, and manufacturing in space. And the reason why we're thinking about this is, you know, we we're seeing improved materials with fewer defects and superior physical properties and increased performance. We're going to see the next generation materials with exceptional precision and quality. You know, one of the big things that we're seeing as well is macroeconomic alignment and reduction of dependency on other nations. What can we do from an advanced material production here, um, as opposed to, as I mentioned, relying on other nations? Things like the, the CHIPS Act here in the US and all of the onshoring priorities are driving a lot of this innovation in looking for new solutions in advanced materials. And then, you know, tied back to human exploration and colonization, we're seeing that novel materials and technologies can mitigate those challenges. When we talk about advanced material in space, and I'm sure, Lynn, you're going to be talking um, more about this, but there have been, um, you know, big advantages of why would we go to space for advanced materials? And you can see here a lot of the phenomena of of why space ranging from the microgravity impacts to the vacuum to solar energy and the low environmental impact but there's also the um the, the point that we are creating these novel materials these better performing materials um but this has been limited um in terms of of the research done on the iss and the reasons why are there are constraints with furnace, you know, the furnaces on the ISS, specifically the high temperature furnaces, um, the LGF and the SUBSA can't provide enough high temperature for long enough durations, with SUBSA being uh, only able to get to 800 C for one hour. The sample volume is very small and there are backlogs to access the equipment. As we've talked about, there is a big oversubscription on ISS facilities. 
Other limitations include, include that the motions of the ISS and, and crew uh, increase effective microgravity. So one of the things we could talk about today is, you know, vibration levels on the external platform, because I know that's something that's interesting um, to all of you. Uh, one of the other limitations is the safety concerns. So one of the things, and, and, and you know, Thanks to Debbie Sineski and all of the folks, uh, Gary Rodrigue, and all of the folks um, that had a big part to play in this topic area, which started, in my, in my opinion, with that Stanford uh, first workshop. And what came out of that workshop were recommendations on looking at uncrewed facilities and external platforms that could reduce vibrations looking at longer processing times in orbit and higher power. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, one of the other things that we wanted to mention, um, and again, hopefully we can get to some of this during the open discussion, is we are tracking many US agencies that fund space-related R&D and education. And you can see here a list of, of some of these agencies, and we've got participants uh, from some of these agencies on the, the workshop today. So thank you so much for attending. Um, we're also looking at, you know, what are those specific funding opportunities which may aid our discussion, you know, as workshop participants, could we poten potentially tap in to some of these funding opportunities uh, to look at the work that we're all doing in in space uh, advanced material substrates and uh, and and manufacturing, so uh, a list here going on to the next page. Um, Tanya uh, from Space Commerce Matters will be also speaking during this session, and uh, she really is an expert at identifying uh, these funding opportunities and tying them to the relevant work that we're all doing. Um, so that's what I've got for you today uh, as an as an intro. And so now I would like to uh, hand it over. And I, I said this to Lynn right before we started um, to the iconic goddess, who is the NASA strategic integration advisor to the ISS National Lab. I mean, this work has been pioneered by Lynn for so many years. And Lynn, thank you so much um, for joining us today. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and hand it over to you, Lynn. So first of all, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here and it's very exciting to see this field develop. Um, I actually did my first space shuttle experiment in at beginning in 1978. We flew in 1992, just to let you know how long the development cycle used to be. Now in INSPA, we go from first funds to first flight routinely in two years. Two to three years is our average and most of things fit within there. So we're able to respond better. So let me um, bring this up. I'm going to try to stick to five minutes talking and then, you know, uh, provide you with the slides. Can you all see the slides? So I imagine that most people are here because you've hung around space and microgravity for a number of years, and you know a lot of the background and a lot of the promise that has been talked about over the decades um, that I've been involved in it. So the question is, what's different now? And before I start, I just want to say that I have never done a single thing of relevance alone. And this is no exception. Um, the people that have been involved in this, uh, the leadership of Kevin Engelbert, um, who's the NASA InSpot Portfolio Manager, has just been outstanding and enabling to this effort. Uh, Dr. Rose Hernandez and before her, Dr. Ken Sabin from the ISS National Lab and the ISS National Lab itself has been a key player in the development of this uh, pioneering the latest results from the field. And it's the latest results that are important. Um, Curtis Hill um, is the, our NASA lead, our NASA INSPA lead for semiconductors, and Mr. Gary Rodriguez um, has been a consultant and a developer in this area for um, going close to a decade now, I think. Uh, we go way back, and he's helped us put together a lot of our thinking in this area as well. 
Um, there are also, though, this is standing on the shoulders of the companies and the inventors and the researchers who have gone over the past 40 years to contribute to this area. So I tried to think about this in terms of what would be the most useful and what can we cover the fastest. So I just want to tell you a story that in 2013, the Space Portal, which is my home organization, did a study for Dr. Alex McDonald, to, um, NASA's chief economist, on how is gravity impeding U.S. industry? We talked to over 500 CEOs, CTOs, um, chief technologists, chief engineers in a lot of the uh, high-tech companies mostly in Silicon Valley, but actually around the world. And then we reviewed absolutely every result that was in the NASA microgravity database to see what that meant to the information we had gotten from the CEOs. And it came out like this, that um, the overall trend in high tech 10 years ago was for more bandwidth, faster processors, greater energy efficiency, specific wavelength applications for lasers, more processing power in smaller volumes, better performance in extreme environments, more effective pharmaceuticals and treatments, and atomic and molecular level precision. And you can add to this list semiconductors because there is no end to that demand in sight. And already in 2014, it was pushing materials and processes to the point that defects at the atomic and molecular level matter. And that's where microgravity can help. Or at least in 2014, that's where we thought microgravity could help. Because microgravity sciences has been the kingdom of the anecdotal data. There have been very few studies that had sufficient repeats. But when you look at what where we are in 2024, that that prediction 10 years ago is more true today than it ever was. As I say, now add semiconductors to this list. So that's where NASA's in-space production applications came in, which is to turn the discoveries over the past 40 years into applications in biomanufacturing and advanced materials um, for, the folk, for the benefit of all. So the InSPA program began in 2020. So we're only three years old. It's to serve U.S. interests by developing materials and technologies that strengthen industry leadership, improve national security, create high quality jobs, and provide the benefits to humanity. And through this process, we would expect to accelerate development of the space economy and to increase national workforce proficiency by providing access to the space environment to practice, to develop the manufacturing skills and technology technologies and techniques that you need to, to produce superior products. So I'm going to basically skip this one and just say that in order for um, a product to make sense in space, it not only has to be better than what you can do on Earth, but so much better that you can, um, it's worth spending the money to manufacture it in space. To do that, we stand on the shoulders of basic research, applied development through SBIRs, and then INSPA comes in here in the orange and picks up through the technology valley of death all the way into a working application. So where are we? Not at nine yet. We are in a lot of them in seven and eight, and we started at four, and that's just over the past couple of years. Let me give you a couple highlights. What's the most important thing to know is that everything you thought about microgravity improving crystals is a lot better than you think. And um, it, the, the uh, capabilities of microgravity related to thin film deposition and the control of it is a lot better than you think. In this particular case, this is LAM division. It was enabled by an idea of Cindy Butos, and it was outstanding. The INSPA criteria for success was for LAM division to be able to produce 100 layers of precisely deposited composite. They are at 200 in space. So this is moving forward in important directions. But this is the part that most people need to know because it changes the way you think about microgravity. And the way you should think about it is that the materials cannot help but get different configurations as a result of being in microgravity. So, we kind of all knew that microgravity was better for crystals, but we knew it the way that we know that Europa is a moon, excuse me, of Jupiter. Um, it doesn't really intersect with your day-to-day -day life, but these are amazing 
results. In macromolecular crystals, these are the ones that are needed for pharmaceuticals, the 81% of them grew larger, 73% were structurally better, 88% were more uniform, 81% had improved resolution, and 77% had improved mosaicity. The reason this is important is that these are like the first or second runs. So this is at the very beginning when you make all of your mistakes. In organics, um, was similar results. In fact, it didn't matter whether it was as simple as table salt or as complex as monoclonal antibodies, microgravity made a difference and it also made a difference in semiconductors. Um, and just to let you know, we looked at these more recently and updated it. Size was not an important factor for most of them, but the uniformity, structural quality and performance were, and it's up over 80%. It takes a village to make all of this work. And for those that are going to be working with uh, Bartolomeo or any other platform, there are a whole bunch of things that they that you will that newcomers will need help on in order to craft a successful venture in space. And uh, there are proposal opportunities, but basically Cindy and Tanya's were better and I took a screenshot of theirs. Uh, but these are the ones that I have associated with for Inspire and Inspa. And then uh, just a quick screenshot, if you want the data on the crystals, these are the sites. We've got uh, two journal articles already published in one in, in development. And these are the folks that also can give you some additional information. So let me stop there and hope I've whetted everybody's appetite. As soon as I end mic, uh, my dog starts barking, and I think that's because she was uh, very impressed with that presentation, Lynn. Um, and I do want to clarify, uh, I, you know, Nicole Wagner as the uh, CEO and founder of Lambda Vision, uh, you know, she is the real innovator here. Uh, my my only input was the mass challenge um, accelerator and bringing bringing those folks to space. So uh, all kudos go uh, to Nicole Wagner on that. Um, we are getting questions like right now, and I'm wondering, should we just answer this quickly on can we monetize these improvements in crystals? Um, I think we can talk about that much more during the open session, but I would say based on the work that we've done over the past uh, you know, five, six, seven years, we are seeing levels of magnitude of price um, increases. What you could sell for $50 a unit, you can sell for $500 a unit type of levels of magnitude. So we can get into some more specific examples uh, then. So why don't we, uh, Lynn, thank you so much. Such an impressive presentation and uh, look forward to hearing more from you as, as we continue speaking. So now I'd like to turn it over uh, to Chris Connell, who is the Managing Director of Space Exploration Services at Airbus US Space and Defense. So over to you, Chris. And Lynn, can you stop uh, sharing so that uh, Chris could bring up his slides, please? Thank you so Did much. That work? Yep, it did. Thank All right. you. Well, first off, thank you, Cindy, and, and thanks everybody for joining today. I know we have a few folks that were here with us a couple months ago when we went over Bartolomeo, and um, I'm going to try to share here. And um, then, I'll, you know, for everybody else that's come forward, I, th I think, um, you know, Cindy and Lynn have really set the stage for how we, you know, the conversation we want to have going forward here. I, you know, I wanted to take a couple minutes just to do a quick recap of Bartolomeo um, in terms of, you know, capabilities, um, requirements, that type of thing to kind of help bound this discussion. But hopefully this will lead to some open, just open communication, open discussion on options. We've got, you know, um, from my office here, we've got Carl Cunell and, and Michael Galen here to support on technical discussions. But, you know, to, to touch real quickly, you know, when Lynn, one of her last slides there talk, talking about it takes a village. Well, I think it's clearly evident by the magnitude of these type of INSPA initiatives. But so in terms of that village, you know, Bartolomeo, we can provide infrastructure, right? I mean, Bartolomeo, I'll go through the charts here. Can, are the charts up, by the way? Again, Bartolomeo, commercial external payload platform, uh, you know, manufactured by Airbus, installed on the Columbus module here on the leading edge of station. The, the look we have here would be from Nadir looking up. You see the platform here 
on the on, on Columbus, this would be the you know towards the top of the screen would be the, the the flight direction of the station as it's moving forward. And again, I just want to take a couple minutes to recap some of the highlights of the platform, and then we'll get into discussion. So you're not going to get the 30 something page presentation. Sorry, I know that breaks everyone's heart. So why Bartolomeo? Try to summarize this kind of quickly. Um, I think the main points that we like to bring bring forward is, you know, first off, it's, it's affordable and fat, it, we, we provide fast, easy access to space. Now, fast and easy access, access to space is certainly a relative term, but, um, you know, we can, we can do turnarounds from contract signature. You know, nominally, we like to schedule things in the 12 to 18 month time frame, but we can do it in 12 and we've done it faster. Um, you know, we've got reliability of the platform's you know, capabilities and, and, and functions. Scalability of missions, I think that's really important. We have some slides coming up on this a little bit later, but I always say, you know, we can accommodate payloads anywhere from the size of a loaf of bread to the size of a washer dryer. Um, we have multiple interface, multiple hosting options, multiple power options, and I think, you know, we have a lot of flexibility, I would say, and flexibility to me translates into options for the payload community. So as we have these discussions as to, you know, can we do this? How might we host that? I think that's where this, this flexibility comes into play. Uh, theoretically, launch opportunities with each, um, you know, it says every three months, but with each um, each crew resupply mission. The process, again, streamlined, easy, again, a very relative term and when you're talking space, but as part of our what we call end-to-end -end space mission service, we we kind of provide guidance through that entire process, helping you know with with supporting the payload development phases, then you know uh, working through safety certification, getting everything manifested to fly, then working with cases, uh, you know your up mass, your astronaut time, time on orbit, um, comms, that whole thing, and then we have the opportunity to provide. Well, I missed best viewing conditions on the ISS. So on the leading edge, uh, when we say best viewing conditions, you know, we certainly have very good, relatively unobstructed nadir, zenith, um, ram. We can actually have wake as well in certain cases. And you can you can also be positioned in a place to, to take advantage of multiples of those. So that's why I believe that's different than a lot of other locations, which can provide zenith or can provide nadir. But here you can have, you know, something that's actually exposed to you know, all of these different these different viewing options. And then we have the, the potential for payload return, which um, certainly has its benefit in, in a lot of scenarios. Just real quickly here, you know, the, the size slots, I was talking about the loaf of bread and the washer dryer. So our standard payload slot is what, about a meter cubed, uh, roughly um, up to 450 kilograms. Then we have our Argus multi-payload platform, which allows us to basically subdivide a single payload location into multiple user opportunities. So we have five up to 10 different payloads on a single Argus plate. Right now we're configured for five, but it could be expanded. And then we also have the double slot capability, which you know allows us to bring up, we're, we're still in the same mass, constraint, but with the double slot, we have more power. So you can either, this can either host two different payloads or it can use those, those um, multi, you know, two power slots to kind of bolster your capabilities on there. So again, there's flexibility in terms of sizing. Um, again, uh, so talking here, the Argus multi-payload adapter that's developed here out of our Houston office and manufactured. And actually, we've just turned all this over for flight in the last the avionics went over about a week ago, I think, right, Carl? And then yeah, um, it's transferred over yeah. to cargo mission, yeah. For a right, and we've got our first sortie of payloads that have been delivered. So the first Argus mission will go up in March and you'll be installed you know, somewhere in that April time frame. So we're excited about that. And this is a, a full U.S. Um, offering here onto the platform. And you see here we can, you know, I said I said a loaf of bread. We can go down as small as one U and then up to a maximum of 127 U, depending on you know how we configure the avionics box or if we use a what we call an Argus Max, which is a plate without avionics and dual um, interfaces into the 
the gold connector. You see the different power capabilities, location on Bartolome. We you know essentially each of the payload locations we can subdivide using the Argus. Um, and I'll try to keep this moving a little quicker. So I kind of talked about slot sharing. Um, this just kind of recaps, I think, a lot of what I already talked about. I don't think anything introduced here is, is new, and we can certainly cover as we go forward in any of the discussions. Chris, you're, well, getting, you're getting quite a few um, questions on Bartolomeo that I think rather than wait until after your presentation, um, we could we could just sort of interject them here as you're presenting. Does that work for you? Well, that works great because this is the last slide anyway. <laughs> so I, I knew that. I, I said this was an abbreviated <laughs> version, so this just um, kind of lays out a, a cartoon as to how the, the comms capability works back down from stationed to, to, you know, access to your payload, right? We have go through standard ISS comms paths. It comes down through Tedris or, or through our, our, I guess, the um, Cole CC, the Columbus Control Center. Um, this then moves over to the Bartolomeo Control Center, and then you have access to your payloads or interfaces via the Airbus cloud. So that, that was just a, a quick recap. Hopefully that kind of sets the stage along with um, the information provided before by Cindy and Lynn. So we, we can dig into the questions. And again, yeah, we have so Carl and Michael here that can really help with the. These are these are not necessarily technical um, yet. So um, one of the questions is, can Argus go out through the Kibo airlock? Yes, the Jam airlock, I guess, is it, it can go through the, that or the Nanorax airlock the in rail either one and the the so the the size payloads we were noting here these these are based on the the gem airlock the kibo airlock and that's you know kind of the maximum airlock volume we can accommodate through there so i guess there's potential if we were to use the nanorax airlock to have maybe a little maybe some flexibility on that as long as we still get through the hatches and so forth Comments to that, Carl? No, that's exactly right. Yeah, this was optimized. Yeah, to, to always have the capability to go in and out of the gem airlock or the Kibo airlock, as you said. Um, but yeah, there is room capabilities for growth of that envelope. Again, that complement of experiments if we go into the Nanorax airlock. So that can be grown, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. And to access uh, Bartolomeo via an ISS NLRA, a national lab research announcement, does Airbus need to be the implementation partner. I don't know if we have to be the implementation partner, but we would definitely be the. I, I think that's different being a commercial service provider through cases, ISS National Lab versus an implementation partner. I think we could be both actually, or you could have a different implementation partner and utilize Bartolomeo via the commercial services, um, commercial payload services side, I believe. Okay. Cindy, do you know any got a better? I mean, I think one of the things that I, I think <laughs> the one background of the things, there. Yeah, no, I think one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, there's a whole host of implementation partners with facilities that have historically been used inside the ISS. And, you know, I think as we're talking about this new model of using Bartolomeo as an external platform to alleviate all of the oversubscription internally, you know, et cetera. I think there could be really natural scenarios where any other implementation partner could be using Bartolomeo with their facility, their box, their, sure. you know, their activity. And so, so I think the answer is yes. And I think that's really what we're looking at achieving through these discussions, which is, you know, it's not either or, it's and, and it's really looking at what do these solutions look like um, as each implementation partner is now looking at creating advanced facilities um, or ad advanced material type facilities. So Chris, I think, I think you know, and that's something you've talked a lot about um, in the past. 
Yeah, I think, again, I think it's either or, depending right. on how that's structured. Yep. Uh, and then, um, uh, to, uh, let's see, what was the other one? Um, is the ISS National Lab sponsoring anything hosted on Bartolomeo right now? But I'm thinking of the definition of hosting. I'm going to say no. Okay. Uh, and then I think there was a follow on with that, not using ISS Wi-Fi, which maybe we can wait uh, till the open discussion to to get more clarity on on that. Um, my team has been very fortunate to have been selected within an ESA uh, French Space Agency, the Kness campaign, to fly four CFRP composite samples in the Sesame module on the Bartolomeo platform. Specific specimens have been integrated, hopefully leaving in August of this year. It's planned to be up to an 18 month campaign. What is your typical return time uh, for us to get our hands on the samples again to examine them? Congratulations, Ian. We've got a, a, mm -hmm. another iconic figure here with Ian Hamerton. Um, so during the open discussion, Ian, hopefully you can talk about some of the work you're doing and congratulations on this uh, selection. This sounds amazing. Uh, so Chris, over to you. So what's our typical return time to get the samples once they come down? Well, we haven't done it yet. So I, I, I would I would think. Um, I don't I don't know that I have a, a good answer for that. Uh, I would think it would be com kind of commensurate with the the, the return times we have on any other other payloads, right? I mean, they come down. You have to get access through the through the vehicle and then distribution. Um, Carl, I don't know, if, Carl, if that's been discussed in any other circles. Yeah, if sure. not, we can run that down. No, sure. We we've always envisioned yeah having return hardware. Actually, we do have some manifested for the first mission that will be slated manifested to cut return after their their deployed mission of up to a year, let's say. So they come in, they'll get loaded <laughs> on a returning vehicle. Um, so I don't know if the question was once they do return on that vehicle down to earth, how quickly we can get access to them. Of course, that's very quick. Uh, yeah, it's a SpaceX vehicle or such. Um, uh, so uh, so the, actually the turnaround is very quick and there is an absolute capability within the station uh, to have a return manifest and hardware set up, the ability to uh, retain its stowage foam and stowage capabilities to return it to Earth. So that's absolutely been envisioned, and it's really a, just part of the process, I would say. Once it's in station, the return is just the next returning uh, vehicle uh, and the ability, of course, to manifest it. So there's some program interaction, certainly, that we need to coordinate, but it's doable. Right. Yeah, and I think uh, if the question was time frame once it's back, um, I don't. I, we could probably reach weeks. out to one of the guys here that does some similar work and get an answer. But I would say it's days, not weeks. But that would no, be it's absolutely guess. days. And actually, the re, you know we have other bio samples that we've uh, uh, coordinated return of our other uh, different group uh, that they return. They get them very quickly, like within hours. So there's absolutely, if it's a time critical biological component, there is that quick ability to have things returned okay. and transported. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, I think this is I think the questions are now flowing. And uh, given that you're done your slides, there's still a few unanswered questions. But I think at this point, why don't we open it uh, to open discussion where we could potentially answer some of your other questions that are coming online? Uh, we're getting questions on uh, rough costs and other uh, more technical questions, but let's, let's, why don't we um, open it up? Definitely have, um, you know, the things that I know we from our last workshop that people are interested in learning about um, are about the, the, some of the details of the platform capabilities and the costs. Um, you know, we've covered already how to install platforms, get installed, how, you know, how frequently they can be accessed. Um, another sort of, I think, area that's you know maybe of interest that um you know that we received some inquiries about um from registrants was about the quality of the vacuum on the platform um and then there's also um maybe a related question in the uh the chat as well but maybe i'll let i'll let you chris respond to that do you have any information about what kind of vacuum is available around in the around the platform and also as a wake shield possible jump in but no it's a, a obviously it's a hard it's a 
it's a station environment. Uh, uh, you have a deep, uh, or, let's see, low earth orbit vacuum environment. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly um, yeah, what the, the deviations are in and around station or the Bartolomeo platform. I'm sure we could find that and take an action to mm -hmm. provide specific numbers um, if needed. Um, so we we could do that again. As I said, it's it's and then station should advertise that uh, value quite, <coughs> yeah, efficiently. You would think. Um, so so that we can uh, get back to you on as far as a wake shield. Um, goes, we have the ability to, um, I, I guess we need some more information on how you'd want to try and implement that. Uh, we are talking about attaching payloads to the uh, to the Bartolomeo platform. You might have saw how that, uh, where's that, that's located on station. Uh, so maybe a little bit of clarification on what, what is you're looking for in that, in that uh, environment. Now that was a question from one of the registrants and it was uh, submitted anonymously, so I'll have to Hopefully that person, if they're off, if they're on the call, can um, raise their hand and add some more clarification. So uh, I was uh, involved in producing a document called the uh, External Payloads Proposers Guide to the International Space Station, uh, and I've I've seen that document made available uh, with some uh, ISS uh, solicitations, including the INSPA, for instance. Um, so. That does have some information about contamination, and uh, good news is that uh, pointing in the RAM direction is great. <laughs> pointing towards the Russian segment is less great. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's some some data uh, available there. Uh, so the ISS Wi-Fi system, um, I was just wondering uh, if it, you know how how well you know about that. It looks like you. Where you are, you might not have much line of sight to any of the Wi-Fi receivers. So um, it, it may be that uh, the only the only comms available is uh, you know through the station uh, through hardwire, as as you were saying. So have you have you had any discussion with the ISS people about uh, access to Wi-Fi from this location? Funny you should ask. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Steve, I could probably talk to that, and, and absolutely we have. So uh, we have done some assessments so with the ISS uh, Wi-Fi team here at JSC and into some detail. Um, we've actually implemented Wi-Fi, I would say, from on, a, on, on the GEM external porch as well on a previous payload. But looking into this partial Mayo platforms, we, we have. Um, we've discussed that. We do have a good line of sight over to the current WAP. Um, uh, antenna that's currently on uh, on the U.S. segment and there's been discussion of actually moving that um, that access point uh, as they reconfigure as things configure of course as you know for axiom eventual arrival and that kind of a thing to move that access point more toward the Columbus module uh, so that's some discussion between ESA and, and NASA on whether that where, where and how that could be located but We've absolutely looked at um, at implementing a Wi-Fi capability to actually get data and route data back into the into the U.S. segment as well. Um, yeah, to, to break that out and have the, I would say, a, yeah, yeah, it would be one or the other. Uh, the, yeah, obviously, ESA doesn't allow for a, a parallel path, right, of data flowing into two different components. That's why they have them separated. But but that has been looked at to answer your question, and 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 is it planned to be implemented? Quite frankly. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. All right. I, I think I am really messing up the name. Is it Laura? Is it Sorgi? Is it Johan? Is it over to you? And please uh, correct me on my my mistakes here. Well, your pronunciation was right. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Just the wrong <laughs> order. <laughs> yeah, I have two last names, but you can call me Laura. Um, okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura. Um, I'm a student, uh, but I do. Um, do a lot of my research in this area. So I have a I have a few questions. Um, and particularly I'm interested in space weather and how that might affect a lot of these um, uh, advantages of microgravity. Uh, so my question is if there's any plans or are there any projections for the risks of these products during severe weather events? Because I see the interest is more on like external um, uh, external payloads. So if that has been taken into consideration and 
the results presented by Lynn, I assume, um, do not reflect um, how radiation might introduce impurities, right? So they, yeah. they do actually. Um, you know, if I can just jump in, um, the and and one of the results that we got was that we had a galactic cosmic ray event that basically fried the controls. It happened randomly. It came out of the blue and it basically stopped the experiment uh, for a period of time. And that happened just a couple of years ago. So it does happen. Uh, one of the things that we do in trying to advise companies who are looking to do work long term in space is to design their system so you can replace boards, basically designed for plug and play. And then you'll be able to swap things out. You may lose that research interval because of an event like that. But for the most part, the ISS has always been um, very supportive when those when the causes are things beyond an investigator's control to give them another shot at it. It doesn't always happen, but it often happens. Sorry, I guess my question was more um, towards the, the products themselves. Um, not so much, you know, if like the data collection or the technology on board, but more the the crystals themselves. Um, if shielding is considered for that? Not not to any of the ones that I've seen. Um, there would be, if you had a um, um, high energy particle interact through the crystal, you could probably get some defects. And again, the crystal improvements have not been 100%. Um, some of them we know the answer to, there were you know uh, problems with hardware, the rest of them um, were were good. Um, are they perfect? It, it's a good question. I'm not sure how we would shield. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I'm not sure what we would do that would be other than growing crystals within the vehicle, which is slightly better than growing it outside the vehicle. I, I would say they're roughly equivalent. And I, I actually, I did want to make a comment about the vacuum. My recommendation is measure it. Um, we have a lot of hypotheses about what the vacuum environment is in any mm. particular location but if it makes a difference in the quality of the output of the product you should measure it okay so then just to clarify the results and i think it was your slide 13 um, your percentage of the advantage um the size and all that that was for an external or internal growth to the best of my knowledge they were all internal yeah. I think so. Yeah. There were some free flyers. There were free flyer spacecraft, but they were inside the vehicle. They were not exposed to the ambient. The vehicle as in um, ISS. No, actually this goes back to 1973 and the first um, crystals that were grown in space were on Skylab. Yeah. Skylab, okay. Yeah, and then there were others that were flown on free flyer spacecraft for China, uh, Japan, Russia, US. Uh, we all flew in some free flyers over the decades. So that those 500 crystals go all the way back to 1973. And Lynn, maybe here we can ask Debbie Sineski to jump in. Uh, Debbie, if that's not putting you on the spot. Um, you know, uh, in addition to the workshop and the work that Debbie is doing um, uh, at Stanford on this area, um, I know that there's been discussions with Ann Wilson, who's doing for you, Lynn, a big, broad view and look at all of the, like an audit and an a observation of all of the crystallization work that's been done. I'm wondering, um, as Debbie is hopefully uh, getting un unmuted, um, Lynn, do we know if um, uh, Ann Wilson has uh, noted any of this phenomena or, or identified any of this in the work that she is doing uh, with you? So specifically radiation, no, but um, I just want to, uh, again, endorse uh, Dr. Wilson's work from Butler University because she's the one that really was re instrumental in pulling all of the data together. Um, there were some that were specifically designed to be radiation sensitive crystals. I just don't recall the, the exact information, but you should be able to find it in the database. Okay. Because its purpose will be radiation monitoring and, and, and um, 
I believe they, I, so they always identified the vehicle also in the database. And from that, you can determine whether it was internal or external. Great. Great. Oh, that's I think Laura, so sorry, oh. your question, where can I find this database? <laughs> oh, I, you know what? I had it on one of my slides. And so all I, I can, what I can do is I can just pull up the slide and then uh, let you take a screenshot of it or just share the slides. I, I believe um, slides are going to be um, shared. Yep. Yeah. We'll okay. so we'll, we'll, with your permission, then we'll share them. Thank it's you. all in the public domain. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Great. So I just want to make a quick comment to that. Just, just Laura, I think these are precisely the type of questions that need to be asked right now and that, that you're kind of hoping to get to bring forward in this type of exchange because to take this from a research environment to a commercial environment, these are the type of things that have to be figured out, right? And it all, it's all incremental, right? We, we figure out, we, we find issues that or, or areas that may be issues, and we we research that and see if there's impacts due, based on space weather. If so, how do we shield those, or how do we mitigate that? And this is all part of, you know, my battle cry on this is viability and scalability. That's what we're trying to prove out the early part of this transition from research to commercial. So those are, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that, but that's that's precisely what the payload community and and then also then you know whoever's registered in the results need to be taken into account. So. Good exchange. Excellent. Right. Excellent point, Chris. So, so why don't we segue here? Um, uh, what I'd like, like to do is have Debbie uh, give a few comments, but then exactly to what you just said, Chris, uh, folks that have been in the chat, like Stephen Wood, talking about some of the work he's done that have that could have a big commercial um, uh, market, and maybe we can hear from him in terms of some of those challenges. Um, as well as Ian Hamerton on the work that he is doing. But but before we segue to those two, um, Debbie, I think you're unmuted, and I'm wondering if you have any reaction yeah. to the conversation we've been having. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to speak, and thanks for bringing the community together. Uh, and certainly this has been on our minds to identify and prioritize you know, our first activities as a community, identifying which particular materials we want to either bring out of hibernation. So, for example, repeating some experiments that were conducted on the space shuttle and perhaps new materials that have specific properties that are desirable for both space for Earth and space for space applications. And one thing that, uh, you know, Ann Wilson has brought to light, and it looks like the resources are placed here in the chat by Jessica and Gary. Uh, that database is critical as we can harness that data to, you know, uh, what Ann is saying is have a data driven approach, right? We don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel. There are a range, hundreds of materials that likely have radiation hardened properties or transduction properties that have already been manufactured in low Earth orbit. Um, and then we can also harness that to, you know, advance further materials. So we have a little bit of traction, right, from the past, but we want to enable things that uh, are important today, right, for markets that are market sectors that are out there today. And we think semiconductors are the mar is the market sector right now. But, you know, there are a range of semiconductors and we need to work together to prioritize. So it's great that we're bringing together the community so we can identify specifically what we need in terms of technical specs and then also uh, identify specific targets of interest. Yep. Yep. And and to that point, I'm wondering, and especially given the comment in the uh, in the chat, uh, given that you and Jessica Frick are the rock stars in this area, uh, I wonder, Jessica, if you want to add anything to what Debbie uh, just said as well. Uh, and if so, raise your hand and you can become unmuted and un, uh, you can put your video on. Um, OK, here's here comes Jessica. Are you unable to uh, unmute? Are you able to unmute her, Abe? Oh, yep, I think oh, we got there it. we go. All right. So, Jessica, anything to add to what Debbie just said? Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, I second everything Debbie just said, but I uh, also wanted to um, talk about the radiation because I think the radiation aspect is something quite interesting. Um, and so Laura, I already added you in the chat, um, but it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually wanted to take some time and ask some questions of myself. I've been waiting to raise my hand. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and do that now. Um, in terms of the power availability, um, can you actually go back to the slide where you talk about, you know, the size of the payloads and the the power? Um, so if we were to use, let's say, I just want to do a thought experiment with you all. Um, so the largest payload, you know, is 127U. And you're saying that, you know, for each payload, it's about 150 watts per payload. All right. So if you're using that entire area of the 127U, what is that actually in wattage that you could give us? But Carl, jump in to make sure I don't mess this up. But I'm going to say, I mean, if you're if you're talking about having a full slot payload rather than subdivided. A series of subdivided payloads. 800 watts is our maximum power capability on certain locations. Is that right, Carl? Um, yeah. So if you took both, you know, if you took, let's say, a Bartolomeo slot, we can get up to 980 watts of power uh, at, from Bartolomeo. I think what we're looking at now, of course, is now the Argus platform, which does have some limitations based on it, at least the powered uh, version, the one with the avionics box that we're looking at right now. Um, those are limited. Uh, those are limited in their power provisioning capability to a smaller subset of payloads, about 150 watts peak, 120 watt uh, steady state, and then also then the other four slots uh, limited to 100 watts peak, 85 watts steady state. So. So the Argus is limited and the Bartolomeo has the potential, the capability, let's say, to provide up to 980 watts per, per dual bucket slot. That's one of those slots that has the, the A and B aspect to it. So I don't know if you showed that. That was one of the configurations. Yeah, this double slot uh, bucket, exactly. That, uh, okay, so question then, you know, if our payload size is, um, actually, can you back up a slide? Great. So if our that payload one? is around the size of that 60U kind of blue box there, um, but we're going to require, you know, to draw 980 watts, where does that leave us with doing slot sharing with others? Would we have to go up, you know, by ourselves as a lone payload because we couldn't draw from the others neighboring? Um, how would you, um, I, I guess, approach that issue? And then what would that be in terms of cost? That's a great question. Yes, yeah, so well, I'll say what I think, which is if you're going to need that 980 watts, then it would be a what we call a standard slot payload, um, you know, an individual slot, because I don't think there's anything left for for slot sharing out of the power budget at that point. Is that a fair assumption, Carl? It, it is. Um, I would say there's two parts to that, though. You know, currently what we're calling the um, well, the second Argus platform that does not have an avionics box. It routes data direct or power data directly from Bartolomeo. It does have the capability to route that 980 watts of power to a a payload. Um, and let's call it this blue version. You're looking at this 6U. So that that in per se is is doable. Uh, there'd be a lot of questions about how you do dissipate this heat that would be associated in this small payload, et cetera. But um, all that aside, there is the capability to to route that data. I'm sorry, that power to it, and of course, there are, are data lines associated as well. So um, there is the capability. But is there capability to share with other payloads on that platform at the so, same time? No. In that case, yeah. yeah. Back to that. Yeah, I missed. That there would not be. That would be utilizing the full uh, power capability of that Bartolomeo slot, that location. And again, that would be one of the higher power slots as well. So then I'd be paying for the entire platform. That would be correct. Correct. Yeah. 
And how much is that? (laughs) So so a a single slot right now is is, is roughly about 4.5 million for, and that's, you know, all the support to get the payload flown one year on orbit, all your comms capabilities. So it's the end-to-end service from the, the hosting perspective. And I think I think power is going to be an issue across the board with a lot of these, you know, in space manufacturing applications. But um, that, that's the limitations we're looking at at this point. Uh, following on Jessica's question, the you know what the electrical power cons- constraints are, uh, and you know whether those constraints are are strictly the electrical constraints or if it's also uh, a matter of you know using that electricity for uh, heating applications, then you also have to get rid of uh, your waste heat, right? And so, where the what the constraints are as far as how much uh, waste heat can be uh, rejected um, through the Argus platform. Yeah, sure. I, I can answer that quickly from that uh, simple uh, the nominal perspective. So, so we do not. Um, uh, really allow heat to be conducted into the Argus platform, nor do we radiate it. Uh, so uh, the users uh, on Argus platform have developed, uh, we've worked with them to develop their own radiators uh, capability to then dis- uh, get rid of their heat uh, that's generated by their payload. Um, uh, on, in contrast that, we don't allow other payloads then uh, yeah, conduct heat from themselves through the Argus platform into it, an alter- uh, adjacent payload either. So, so it is up to the payload to get rid of it uh, through their own radiators. That's the current plan, and that would be the same aspect on a on a full Bartolomeo slot. There is no act. There's not any active cooling uh, or or heat dissipation capability um, designed in. That's all will be worked with the payload to design their own system to do that. Great. Uh, also, since I'm unmuted here, uh, I go back to a previous question that was touched on just a, a little bit, but with regards to, and I, I don't expect a full answer here, but uh, the environmental considerations uh, from the vacuum perspective. Uh, you know, this is something you, when you're talking about doing ISAM operations, uh, any kind of uh, chemical vapor deposition or any any kind of deposition, really, you're, you're talking about gas, uh, gas species that some of which may be ejected uh, or exhausted into the surrounding environment. And so uh, it's not the, the answer cannot be zero uh, emission, uh, even though that's, you know, that's the desire of everybody. Uh, but you know, what is reasonable and is just throwing this out there for discussion uh, from the environmental perspective, you know, what what's tolerable from the administrators uh, and you know thinking about it you know from the bigger perspective yeah so uh, real quickly I mean just uh, answer we have looked into yeah the contamination uh, levels that could be foreseen and around the Bartolomeo platform obviously like we said that is one of the cleaner environments um, uh, but there are other um, there has been some uh, some yeah, assessments of that done already. I cannot off the top of my head uh, state any of those. Um, uh, but that that has been certainly looked into what kind of contaminants can be then foreseen with visiting vehicles, right? Um, that kind of a thing, if that's what you're asking about. The the nominal space environment is what it is, right? As far as then, as we talked about vacuum previously, it is a what a very near vacuum environment, obviously not full, but um, yeah. It's um. I think contamination was your question more so. Is that right? Yeah, I'm. I'm looking at it from, uh, both both the perspective of you know, if if I have a uh, a module on there, you know, what uh, <clears throat> what am I allowed to emit? Uh, but also, you know, I might be concerned about you know the purity of my vacuum as well. So you know, just a uh, a topic for discussion. Yeah. No. Sure. All right, and I think just no, to round I, out. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, I was going to say, I mean, there's you know, na- there's there's NASA information on this in terms of you know the contamination in all different locations on station, which I think you know 
would maybe go to the first part of your question and then what you're able to emit, I think that, that may be more of a discussion. I think so, right, and that's not that's a discussion that's been had many a times with many payloads, so it's not a, a uncommon topic. Uh, so yeah, if, if there's something in mind, that would certainly be open to having yeah to help them to run that to ground. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and Jaya, I think to round out the technical questions, and I before we get to the the broader commercial uh, discussions with Ian and Stephen, um, I definitely want to go to Gary, uh, who was. Done, Gary Rodrigue, who is a real driving force in um, the whole in space uh, applications and in space manufacturing area. And he's given us great links to S, uh, NSF, uh, SBIR, and STTRs, as well as Ann Wilson's database. So, Gary, if you could unmike, uh, unmute your mic. But before that, Jaya, I think you have a question about um, uh, the wait time for standard slots. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm um, just curious uh, how much um, these platforms are being utilized and how much, um, how long a team might have to wait for one of those standard slots. I think we were hearing the, um, the a price for one slot, one year on orbit. Just curious um, how long that might take. Well, so we, you know, we're, we're just now, we just started populating the platform. The first uh, full slot mission went up a couple months ago, and then we have uh, the next Argus one going up in March. So we have we have opportunities. You know, we, I got to look into the traffic model, but um, depending on which location you would need, um, I, you know, availability. It may be they may be available right off the bat if you go through the contracting process and move forward, or if you need a specific slot which is occupied, there may be a wait until the mission that's on there. Leaves and again, the mission time is typically one year on orbit. Um, so if, if if that were the case, you'd be looking at our standard, you know, payload processing time of you know 12 to 18 months. And a lot of that depends on the payload itself, how advanced the payload development is. And then we can move through the processing portion more quickly to get to launch and then installation. So there, um, nominally, if there's nobody in that location. So it's it's 12 to 18 months from the time we sign the contract and get moving with the payload to the time we could get you launched and then you know installation is within weeks of that date so pretty quickly if that does that cover what your question was yeah it does thank you okay great all right gary i can see you're here uh over to you gary well i i think this is just a tremendous discussion, and I'm, I'm so appreciative that um, you and Cindy, you and your team pulled this together. Um, just a couple of comments. I think um, there's been tremendous progress and work that's been done, you know, example, the Ann Butler piece of work, but I still think there are huge gaps in in our uh, of knowledge. And one of the things that I'm particularly excited about is not only events like this, um, but Debbie Sineski, um, Dr. Wilson, and Jessica Frick and um, are, are standing or proposing to the NSF to stand up um, a consortium that would bring the community together and help prioritize the work that's being done in a very uh, synergistic manner and and be really a peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. So so taking an event like this and really putting it on steroids because I think you know we need to we have limited capability and limited resources and it's really important that the the community come together and we decide you know what are the priorities and and how do we utilize this unique environment which I personally think is going to be um, an environment that is going to be very transformative um, and it is going to change every aspect of our personal and business life here terrestrially we just don't understand today what that looks like because of the gaps in our knowledge so cindy thanks again for for pulling this together um i just love this discussion and um here to Gary, help in thanks any to way you. Possible. you. You've been a driving force in all of this. So, uh, so thank you, Gary. All right, and and again, thanks for putting those links into very important, um, you know, the report from Ann Wilson and the NSF uh, information. So, looking forward to continued collaborations, Gary. Um, all right, so looks like um, 
I people are starting to drop. We're getting towards the end of this uh, this session, but perhaps Ian uh, and Stephen Wood, you could talk a little bit about the projects that you've, you know, the sort of commercial elements that you see, and or Ian, what you're currently doing with ESA and Kness um, using Bartolomeo. So that's exciting. Sure. Shall I start? Uh, can you sure. hear me? Okay. Yes, Thank you, Cindy. Can. Um, so we're involved in a couple of uh, ESA projects. Uh, the one that I've mentioned is uh, essentially we develop um, polymer composites, composites, um, and we're very much looking at the uh, the chemistry, de developing the, the matrices to hold the materials together. So you know we're developing next generation of materials that go up into a space environment. And our particular focus in this project is to improve the uh, ability of the materials to resist ATOX. So atomic oxygen is a particularly uh, aggressive environment for organic materials. It erodes the, the materials and you end up losing a lot of mass and the material starts to lose a lot of its mechanical strength. So we are working on materials that self heal and also are more resistant to galactic cosmic radiation. So we're involved in two programs. This one, which will see four composites, each of about an inch square. So very small materials will be are, are integrated onto a sesame uh, uh, sesame module. They go onto the RAM face of the uh, Bartolomeo platform, and they'll be up there for about 18 months. And they'll be monitoring the visual uh, visual appearance of the materials to see whether they tarnish or pit. And we'll also be measuring the the mass. So we've done a lot of work over the last four years on these materials, developing them and doing a lot of terrestrial tests. So they've been through their pre-flight tests, outgassing, UV uh, and ATOX stability past those with flying, flying colours. And hopefully now they're, they're all integrated, they're due to go up in August. Um, all been well, if we don't see any further slips in timing, then they'll be up for something like 18 months. And my question really is, obviously we're <laughs> very eager to get our hands back on them afterwards to look at them and see what porosity or whether they've suffered any damage so that we can do a range of post-flight mechanical physical tests on them. So that that was, thank you for answering that, it was very, very helpful. Um, and the other project is, um, is is related to this, but is actually looking at putting the same materials into uh, essentially a, a, an ion accelerator. So we'll be looking at simulated galactic cosmic radiation. So um, in April of this year, we, we have some samples being taken over to Germany. We'll be looking at them in the uh, collider at the GSI Helmholtz Center and looking at whether we can uh, get some more terrestrial information because we're building essentially models to predict lifetime so there's a, a strong a strong kind of uh, boost so that we can understand more about how we would model the structures modify them in in, in silico and in simulation before we actually synthesize them and then determine whether those models give us any uh, good indication of what lifetime is so it's all right. it's, it's all about materials really and uh, this is a really great opportunity really excited about the whole the whole process um and as was said previously, it's it's probably been about um, I think getting on for three and a half, four years since the very start, maybe three and a half years since the very start of being accepted onto the program. Uh, so you've got to be patient. But <laughs> as we yeah. as we near the near the kind of point of flight, it becomes very, very exciting indeed. Well, well, hopefully uh, this is all going to now start accelerating in a hockey sticks uh, type fashion yeah. with all of these new possibilities. And your institute is the Institute of Composites. It's the I'm Bristol forgetting. Composites Institute. Yes. Uh, in I'm the University of Bristol. In the University of Bristol. I'm thinking that a lot of the work that you're doing is synergistic with what we're hearing from, you know, Debbie Sineski, Jessica Frick, uh, you know, a lot of the folks here on the call, mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Wood, who we're going to hand it over to now. So, so I'm really happy that you were able to join us, Ian. Thank and, you for um, and thanks. Looking forward to continued conversations. Thank you. And Stephen, over to you. Um, uh, thanks again. For, you were you were on the last uh, webinar. Thank you for joining this workshop. Uh, and you're doing really interesting work. So do you want to just give a little uh, a, a recap of that? Well, um, it, is it all right if I uh, screen share real quick? Sure. And you know, thank you for your interest in my shares. And let me see how. Chris, I, I think can you might have to stop that. sharing. Yep, yep. I think I, I stopped. I took control. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> wrong, wrong no worries. Right. Um, so let me go for my windows here and pull this up. 
and everyone should see uh, figure 19A of the, the patent I mentioned. And these are some micrographs of the cadmium zinc telluride. And as you can see, you know, we've got some pretty significant um, crystal lattice uh, defects and, and dislocations going on. And so these were various samples that were tested um, using um, the, this charge uh, collection method. Uh, and apparently this was more than a decade ago now, about 12 years ago now, uh, when I was at Brookhaven National Lab. Um, and um, ultimately, uh, if we could get better monolithic materials for this, uh, we wouldn't need to do all of this algorithmic correction, though that would certainly, you know, potentially still have applicability in improving overall performance. Um, uh, I guess, you know, the, for me, um, I had approached um, uh, space from my background um, in uh, patent law. And so when I went to Leiden University to do my Master of Law in Air and Space Law, I, I did a big review of, you know, what are the technologies that have been developed in space? How do we handle the IP around that? And it was really curious to me because it, it kind of harkened back to um, some research um, we had done for a, a technology commercialization project when I was in law school for a client that was working with um, bacterial uh, rhodopsin proteins proteorhodopsin, bacteriorhodopsin. These are uh, seven alpha helix um, kind of antenna, essentially uh, configurations in a hexagonal tile that is uh, implemented by these bacteria on their um, cell membrane to drive a proton uh, pump uh, and proton gradient to produce energy for the cell. Different than you know, uh, photosynthesis and typical other types of cellular energy very similar to the rhodopsin proteins in the back of our eyes. And one of the um, uh, you know, examples I came across in terms of uh, materials development in space was the fact that when these proteins were grown in space, they actually configured into a 3D arrangement rather than the typical 2D arrangement. And so there are absolutely, I just think, incredible uh, opportunities here, both on the biologic side as well as on the semiconductor side, as well mm -hmm. as I would say hybrid technologies between the two as well. Um, and so I have specialized in uh, you know, analyzing how patents work differently for space. They do work quite differently. Um, there's a thing called the temporary presence defense. Um, Hughes Aircraft Co. ran into that with five infringing satellites from the UK that were launched via NASA. And that's for another conversation. If anyone wants to take a deeper dive on that, I'm happy to do so. But thank you again for your interest. Yeah, uh, thank in you. Shares. Thank you so much. And and you know what? We can't forget about all of the other aspects of, of when we start really uh, doing this activity mm -hmm. in space, all of these professional services that are going to be going hand in hand with this, especially space law. So thank you for that, Stephen. All right, we only have uh, nine minutes left. And so Divya, I think you have raised your hand for quite a while. Um, and then I know Steve Leet has another final question and then let's wrap it up. Uh, uh, so my question is around, um, so you already answered the uh, question around how much maximum power, but is there any limitation on how long you can provide that maximum power? Uh, like, can we occupy the slot for three weeks, for example, and have no interrupted power? Um, that and the follow-up question would be, a lot of these uh, in-space manufacturing applications require sample changes, right? You, and, and in the initial stages, you need to actually iterate even the equipment, maybe like fix things. So how would, uh, you know, payload uh, sample exchange and these type of things work? How often can you take it back in and out? That's another thing. Okay, well, I can, I can talk to the second part of that a little bit, and then maybe Carl can, can talk to you about um, the, the first part. So, I get, you know, like so many answers, lots of times it's, it depends. Um, you know, there, it, it, there's limited, there's limited <laughs> airlock capabilities within the ISS. These all have to be scheduled and manifested ahead of time. Now, if, if we're utilizing the Nanorax airlock for some of these, we have a little more flexibility because depending on payload sizes, there could be multiple interchanges there. So I, I think the limiting factor on how often you could bring a payload in, have it changed out and brought back out would be 
tied to what we could negotiate with ISS National Lab and NASA, which is hard to give you a, 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 an absolute answer on that. But I think all other resources would not be an issue in terms of, you know, depending on the complexity, but if it's just, you know, typical astronaut time and, you know, the robotics installation, I think um, that should be easy enough. Now, the, the power, if you're talking uninterrupted maximum power for weeks at a time, I, I, I would guess that has something to do with how many other payloads are on the platform and what the needs are. But Carl, can you lend something to that? Yeah, no, you're, that's that's exactly right. Of course, there's a an overall utilization plan, right? That will be that is uh, developed for each one of these missions, both on the Bartolomeo side and and if we're talking about the Argus sub payload side as well. So we will understand what the power usage is, and of course, and it is um, it is then assessed for continuous use. Um, there is always that caveat that it can be interrupted for a, a variety of reasons. Um, so there could be some intermittent uh, yeah uh, interruptions there, let's say. Uh, but but really not expected. There is the capability, to, let's like you said, for three weeks straight to have a power capability. Again, depending on what that power level is, um, and how that yeah yeah the, the, all the nuances that can come with that. But in general, I would say well, that is planned to be supported in that manner. Yeah. Yes, if I add to that, I guess you know it would be what your requirements were. You know what 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 amount of power for what durations, and then we may need to work timing in terms you know when other payloads are are utilizing the platform and when they're going to need power and you know and make some some modifications there so it would be a little more detailed discussion but it, i think you know that could be addressed earlier in the in the process of course because that, that's a limiting factor you need to have that disposition pretty quickly before you move on okay thank you thanks a lot all right great and i think we have five minutes left, so we want to do a wrap up. But Steve Leet, um, yeah, I think you've got a real quick question. Yeah, it is a quick question. So um, I, I think that the Axiom uh, equipment is going to be mounted uh, near the front there. And I was just wondering um, how that's going to affect uh, the Bartolomeo platform. That's a, <laughs> that's a very yeah. good question. Yeah, that is, and there's been some assessments um, looked into that. We have done uh, both with the station um, a variety of different uh, camp analyses and so forth. Uh, and Michael Gillen is on line too. If you have any, yes, yeah, so technically the axiom, that, the axiom, yeah. the axiom tower, which will be mounted, will obstruct our zenith view. But in terms of nadir view and rem view, it's not uh, interfering with Bartolomeo or at least with the slots we occupy in Kalani. So we did exactly that kind of analysis for a payload, which is going to fly in 2025 um, for the German Aerospace Center. And yeah, that's that's as Carl said, we, we did all this analysis and it's currently just then it and nothing else is obstructed. OK, thanks very much. All right, all right guys. Well, thank you. Uh, with four minutes left, let's do a quick wrap up for any question that we have in the chat uh, that we have not answered. We are going to get back to you uh with with the uh link to this recording of this event as well as the slides that were presented so your answer your questions will be answered thank you everybody for participating really appreciate it thank you to uh lynn harper to chris mm -hmm. and your team um to gary to debbie and jessica for all of the work that you've been doing in this area and this is not one and done. You know, we're thinking these workshops are ongoing. And today what we did is we really sort of kicked off. What does this look like technically? What are the possibilities? Um, we talked about the fact that, you know, there are existing implement implementation partners with existing facilities that are focused in some of these areas. And that the fact that, um, you know, Bartolomeo can be used either independently or in conjunction. It's an either or with some of these other partners. Um, and so maybe as we go forward, some of those potential partners can come on to this uh, workshop discussion to talk about what they're specifically focused on and how that can um, be accommodated on Bartolomeo. Um, in terms of all of these technical questions, I think, Chris, you took it aboard a lot of them and you know, some of them actually related to pricing. Um, and so that's why we were very conscious of identifying what are those existing grants 
um, that exist out there? Uh, where can we look to collaborate to find funding to uh, to support this activity? And especially when we're thinking about, you know, if you need a full slot, because uh, not a full slot, a full a full platform, um, a full slot, you will actually, um, you know, maybe we look at putting together common projects where everybody's got a piece of it and we're looking at common goals with some of this this funding that we can generate so i think this is the very beginning tanya i don't know if i missed anything in terms of uh the recap or some of the bigger messages um the one uh, the last thing i will say though is it feels like there's pockets of activity happening in so many different areas and bringing you all together as subject matter experts, um, you know, this is really, again, the first of it. And hopefully we can um, uh, integrate these ideas and, and move the ball forward for, for all of the work uh, that you're doing. And Tanya, did I miss anything? Um, that was a great summary, uh, Cindy, and I just wanted to add that, uh, well, first of all, it's been such a really interesting and exciting um, uh, online event, and I really enjoyed the discussion. I can tell from the very thoughtful and detailed technical questions that there are um, participants who are, you know, who are, are thinking they have something in specific in their minds and something that they they can envision or they're starting to think about. And I think I'd really like, we only scratched the surface. We'd love to have a future event where we're um, have um, maybe some of the research, the people who are doing research in space or starting to plan research um, of materials research in space could talk more about what they're working on. Great. And um, I, I just add real quick, real quick yeah, to that, go, that, okay. you know, from the, again, you know, we were kind of coming at it from the infrastructure perspective of this village that that's required to move these technologies forward. So in, in that respect, any of these questions that have come up, if we didn't address them or address them in detail enough, please just reach out to us and we can have you know, more, more detailed conversations. And then, uh, and I'll say thank you again for setting this whole thing up because I think this is exactly what we need to do. I mean, you always hear me talk about bundling and I think this is an area where bundling makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, there are lots of different groups with lots of different expertise. And I think the way to really move the needle is to, to bring all that together and then, you know, you know move forward as, as some type of a team. So this, is, this has been fantastic and I, I, I appreciate it. Great, all right, thank you everybody. 